Welcome everyone to Blackbird Writers Presents. Today I've got Libby Fisher Hellman, the author of A Bend in a River. And um, welcome, Libby. Thank you, Tracy. It's great to be here. And, and thanks for the invite. I, I, uh, I appreciate it. Um, and you and I have had a history of meeting up at writers' conferences, and it's great to see that you got published. I'm thrilled. And it's great to see you, you know throwing yourself into this career, this crazy stuff that we do when we decide that we're going to be writers or that we're serious about it. Who knew, right? Right. It is yeah. crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. <laughs> most readers would consider you a crime fiction writer. And so far, you've published uh, the Georgia Davis Mr. Private Eye series, uh, Amateur Sleuth series, a police procedural, not to mention 25 short stories. Right. A Bend in the River is a diversion from your tr traditional mystery series, but, but not if you consider that you've published three other historical fiction books as well. That's true. Um, there's a little bit of a caveat, though, because the, the, there was actually four other historicals, but they were historical thrillers. They were historical mysteries. So I was still using the tropes and the structure of, of, uh, of a mystery novel, which as you well know, you know, plot is very important and it's very well, you know, thought out, you know, when you're supposed to uh, give a clue, you know, when you're supposed to mislead the, the reader, you know, when you're supposed to hit the denouement. And so it's very structured that way. Uh, Bend in the River is not a mystery and it's not a thriller. So in that way, it really was a departure for me because I had no idea what I was doing when I was writing it. Um, I didn't even know I was going to write it until I went to Vietnam. And, um, and yeah. right, and we first met in Wisconsin at the Writers Institute. You had just come back from Vietnam, I think, and you were telling yeah. me some and stories. Oh, the stories were amazing. And I did not know, we uh, until my travel partner and I, who was a librarian from Ohio, um, it's a funny story about the way we met, but anyway, um, she, we were in a Saigon art gallery and we looked at that, what you see in the background, the cover of the book were just two girls you know, in their, in their known laws. And you know, they have, they're both carrying little books. And I was just staring at those, that picture. And my friend Angela saw me staring at it. And she says, you're going to write a book about Vietnam, aren't you? And I said, yeah, yeah. And she said, and it's going to have those two sisters in it, isn't it? And I said, yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, it's going be, and it's going to be set during the Vietnam War. And I, there was something about the way I was talking about it that I knew implicitly it couldn't be a mystery. And it couldn't be a thriller because that just wasn't the story I wanted to tell. I really wanted to tell the story about wartime because my other historicals were set during periods of intense conflict and war or revolution. But this time I wanted to tell the story about two sisters and how they struggled through a war that was tearing their country apart. Because essentially the Vietnam War was a civil war between North and South. And we just got in the middle of it. Yeah. And so, you know, I told the story hopefully from both sides and the sisters are very different. They're from a very um, rural uh, village on the Mekong River. Um, although they do have transistor radios and they listen to the news and rock and roll from the military, you know, radio station and things like that. And they do, you know, they're, they're, they, it's 1968. So they're not as backward as you might seem, but compared to now, I suppose you would, you would call them, yeah, backward. But I remember 1968, so uh, it wasn't, it wasn't that long ago. It was, um, well, I'm sure it was different here than it was in Vietnam. Yeah, it so, was. Um, yeah. So, so that's, this that's is really a book. This is really a book about women, too. The it characters, is. and and it's a it's definitely a woman's story or two women's stories. Um, 
Yes, it so is. Tell- and it, it's also a coming of age story because the girls are 14 and 17 when the story yeah, starts. Yeah. Yeah. And then it goes for 10 years. Um, right. So it's kind of a coming of age story too. Um, and, and at the beginning of the story, they're about to have a normal day when the Americans be- begin firing on their um, village. Yeah. Tell us yeah, what they're, happens. They're washing, the, they're washing their clothes in the river um, with, with stones and pounding on them the way you did back then. And um, they smell smoke and they can't figure out what's going on and they sneak back to the village and they see you know, a whole group of a cadre of American soldiers um, burning their huts, which you know, are mostly made of straw and clay and are just going up like, like firecrackers. And they watch while um, all sorts of you know, things turn bad and suddenly there's a massacre. Kind of like the My Lai massacre, it, you know, it was well known when it happened in 1968 that you know, a platoon leader, a lieutenant kind of went crazy and his soldiers did with him and they massacred a whole village. So I got that over with at the beginning because I knew it was, it was gonna happen at some point and it became the inciting uh, vehicle for the girls, they had to leave. Yeah. And where to go? Well, they they get the, they get to Saigon, which is not too far away from where they lived, which is of course like another world for them. And they find out they well, they always knew they were different, but they find out that they're really different, and their paths going forward are are radically different. One girl, the younger one, who's considered a beauty and is kind of narcissistic at that point in time, what fourteen year old well, isn't though? Yeah you know, um, decides that she wants to be a bar girl in a U.S. bar. And her older sister thinks she's just, you know, it's the next that it's the next thing to being a prostitute. And how do we know you're not going to be a prostitute and blah, blah, blah. And, and really gets on her and, and they have a big argument. And um, the older uh, sister decides she's going to go and fight for the Viet, fight for the Viet Cong, the South Vietnamese co- communists. So they couldn't have been farther apart. And they don't see each other for 10 years. So I follow their stories, right? Going from one to the other as, as, uh, as the yeah. war develops and as they um, encounter things they never thought they would. Right. Yeah, so, they're very different lives. But as you can imagine, during wartime, people are drawn to different ways of living. Exactly. You know, some and people you, want to fight and others try to just get by. Yeah, they, and you always find yourself doing things you, you, you never would have ever considered had there not been a war going on. And uh, some of that did happen. You know, I did a lot of research while I was in Vietnam, but then I had to come back and I had to do even more research. And I found out that that, that part of it is something I love to do, whether I'm, you know, right, I love research. I mean, I love going down rabbit holes and sometimes coming out with a little nugget that surprises me. I'm like, that really happened? Or that really went that way? And I, I figure if I'm surprised, there's a good chance that my readers will be surprised too, if I can explain it well. And I ended up having a lot of these little nuggets that I put together and it ended up, you know, I don't know if I've told you this, but some people know that I hate to write. I mean, I think it's the most <laughs> difficult thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Um, I love having written. I mean, I love holding that book in my hand, but it's always, you know, I've always thought myself, you know, I'm, I'm unequal to the task. I don't know what I'm going to do. Everybody's the imposter syndrome. They're all going to figure out. I don't know what I'm doing. This book was different. I mean, I didn't have the constraints of the mystery plot. You know, I could just go into their lives and talk about this little nugget of information I'd found and how the one sister, whoever was experiencing it, reacted to it. And I didn't have to worry about, oh, am I telling too much or am I going on too long or am I not telling enough? And I just wrote it and it was free and easy. And I found out afterwards and one of my friends, well, you know, Kent, Kent Kruger um, said to me, he said, it was an organic process, wasn't it? And I said, yeah, that's exactly right. It just seemed to fit. And he said, yeah, that's the best kind of writing there is when it all just seems seamless at the event, at the very end. So I really surprised myself. So clearly I'm going to do another one, not right away, but, but I will do another one. Yeah. Do you think this is going to take you off the track of the mystery no. books? No, 
I'm going, in fact, my next book, I'm, I'm right now trying to settle in and think about Georgia. It's going to be a Georgia book, my PI, because I've left her alone now for three books and it's time she gets back into the fire. <laughs> she needs to come back. She needs a new story. Yeah. No, I kind of know sort of where it's going to go, but I haven't figured out any of the details yet. So I need to do some brainstorming with myself. Yeah. What was the best part of the research that you did? Oh, coming up with satisfying stories that I didn't know before, or, you know, people telling us the history of the Coochie Tunnels and what it was like there. That was a, uh, it, it connected to the Ho Chi Minh Trail and it was a way for the North Vietnamese to bring in men and arms and they lived in the tunnels. And there was like an, a, a, a city, there was like a city underground. In I thought that tunnels. was really interesting. Yeah, and I had no idea. And so, that, you know, those kinds of finds were, were pretty amazing. Um, I left out a lot of the, the yucky stuff, like, you know, the Agent Orange and um, the napalm stuff that the U.S. did. And I left out a lot of the torture that the North Vietnamese inflicted on people because, you know, gore is not really my thing. There was enough of it in there anyway. Um, yeah, there was but, enough realism. And you did touch on the... the Agent Orange thing towards the end. Right. So, I mean, it was, you know, all of those things affect people in war. Um, I don't know, do you have any special stories that you wanna tell about that? Well, one thing that surprised me was when I got back, I found some interviews with bar girls in Saigon and I read them and it turns out that you know, although they were shamed and in some cases banished from their families, the girls loved being bar girls. They were, in fact, kind of like the first liberated women of Vietnam. You have to understand Vietnam is a very traditional society. To this day, men are considered much more valuable than women. And, you know, a woman is subservient to a man, even now. But these women, because they were serving U.S. soldiers, were kind of free. They were free to make choices whether they wanted to take the relationship further that, you know, nobody was going to say anything if they did, nobody was going to say anything if they didn't. So, and they would, they would remark about how respectful the U.S. soldiers were and they always called them miss and they said please and thank you and apparently Vietnamese men weren't in the habit of doing that and they were very nice to the women and the women just felt like they were being treated like queens. So it was a funny, none of them wanted to go back to Vietnamese men when the, when the war was over, when the place closed down. A lot of them wanted to, to and a lot of them did get to the United States. So. That, yeah. that was kind of an interesting contrast that I found. And, and then I really enjoyed the contrast between the girls, you know, the conflict between the sisters and whether they were ever gonna find any kind of way to meet themselves uh, or meet each other halfway. And, you know, um, well, I can't really talk about, uh, one of them does have a child and um, that makes a big difference in, in uh, her life. And, and ultimately the life of the two sisters as well. Yeah, yeah, I know, I, I'm afraid to say too much. I don't wanna give anything away. Yeah. Um, both their stories are so interesting too. And I did enjoy how you intertwined and, um, and how ultimately they find each other. Again. Yeah, you know, the big thing about that is you have to make it credible. Yeah. You know, you can't just suddenly show up in the same place. And so um, one comes earlier than the other. One comes legally. The other one comes illegally. And, you know, one has a pleasant journey with, you know, uh, basically the U.S. Army extending their hands in friendship and saying, what can we do for you? And the other one is lucky to get there alive. So yeah, yeah. That, that, that was kind of an interesting story, too. Yeah. Um, well, since the quarantine, people can't get enough from videos and podcasts, as we know these days. Um, yeah. Can you tell people where to find you? Oh my God, where am I not? I feel like I am all over the internet. I do have a monthly podcast uh, with Authors on the Air Network, and I interview up and coming authors as well as established authors. 
Uh, in fact, I just am going to put one. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just going to put one up um, in about, oh, I know, about half an hour <laughs> uh, right. of, some, of an interview I did with Les Edgerton, who has a new book coming out in a few weeks. Um, and I've started to video them as, as you're doing. So you can right. put them on Facebook and YouTube as well as podcasts. So I'm right. doing that. And, um, you know, I guess that, that's about it. I'm participating in them when people want me to. And I do do uh, classes in how to, how to build suspense, which um, I'm now, I've now taken to Zoom. So yeah. I do for libraries and associations, as well as if there's a group of people that want to. Yeah, you still, you were um, with Sisters in Crime for a while. Do you do some classes for Sisters no, in Crime? No, but I, I, I speak to some of their chapters. I come in, you know, in fact, uh, the upcoming um, suspense classes for one of those Sisters in Crime chapters. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Are you getting active in Sisters in Crime? Um, not so much these days. I've been really busy with the Blackbird writers. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that takes a lot of time and you've done a great job. You've got so many people. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We're up to 20 members mm -hmm. and, um, and we all share responsibility. That's terrific because then you won't really have a dead day when someone's supposed to blog and mm, do my blog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so good luck with that. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming, Libby. It was great having you here. You and, and yeah, we'll talk again soon. I hope so. And good luck with your writing. I hope things go well. You Thank you. Okay. Thanks.